This presentation is prepared for the Empowered Trans Women Summit. I really appreciate you sharing this time with me, and I appreciate being invited. Um, a little bit about me before we get started. Uh, my background is in gender and women's studies and community psychology as well. I teach women's studies, uh, women's and gender studies actually, we've just changed the name, uh, at a community college. So I get to talk about social justice all day, every day. So I'm going to share some stuff with you that I do with my students, and I'm going to be shaping it a little bit to what you may be interested in, uh, but you're going to hear some of my spiel from class. Um, I am a cisgender woman, uh, queer, Latina, immigrant. I am from Costa Rica, so English is actually my second language. You'll hear me slip up a few times um, and just know that that's what's happening. I'm going to talk about a few different things today. We will be focusing on a little bit of a basic gender studies, so just basic understanding of gender and how it shows up in the world. We'll also talk a little bit about uh, systems of power, of um, privilege, uh, of advantages, and uh, the way that allies can show up better for each other. So we'll talk a little bit about privilege and oppression. Um, and then we're going to move on to talk specifically about queer issues how the dynamics of queer oppression show up for folks. And there may be some stuff in there that you resonate with. And there may be some stuff that is not actually applicable, applicable to you. <clears throat> so let's get started. We're going to start talking about how gender is understood and how it's been understood in the past. So it used to be that we would assume that by knowing somebody's genitals, we could understand how they would show up in the world. So there would be a new baby born and they would hold it up and say, yay, it has a penis, it's a boy. And you could guesstimate a lot of things about this person's life based on the shape of their genitals. You would know what kind of people they would fall in love with, you would know what kind of job they would have, you would know what kind of emotions they would have, you would know how, how smart they were. You would know pretty much everything about them based on the shape of their genitals. You would even know the color that they would prefer. They would prefer blue over pink. So assuming that you could know everything about a person based on their genitalia was actually where we were coming from. Until we started saying, hey, let's separate this out for a second. The genitals don't actually determine everything in your life. They don't have to determine what you're going to do and how you're going to feel. It could be that you have this shape of genitals and actually like this other thing. So imagine that you could have a vulva and actually like green or blue instead of pink, and that you could fall in love with a woman, not necessarily a man, and that your strength might be in leadership and not tendering, uh, tender, <laughs> uh, tenderness. So we are kind of we've been stepping away from this notion that biology determines destiny and saying you can actually shape your life in the way that makes sense to you. And this is where we started with differentiating sex from gender. And sex was understood as biology, and gender was understood as behaviors and emotions and socialization. That's kind of where we were coming from. We're actually starting to say now that there's a lot more variety in the world than just these two notions. So we're going to do a little bit of gender 101. Here is my handy dandy uh, visual. So we now understand gender to be kind of a different thing. We would start by saying out that sex is the genitalia that you're born with. And again, I'm oversimplifying it. There's a lot more that goes into this. Um, in which we might say that people with vulvas would be called women or girls when they are born, so they are assigned female at birth. And that people with penises would be assigned male at birth. And those were the two boxes that we had for a very, very long time. Um, we have intersex folks who actually don't fit any of the two little boxes. Um, for a very long time, we have abused and mutilated intersex folks because we do not like people to step out of those two rigid boxes. Um, we've gone through horrible, horrible things in which we uh, have operations on intersex folks and um, determine what their life is going to be like without having them have any input. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking sex, is we're mostly focused on biology. And I'm oversimplifying it here by pointing at the crotch, uh, because there's a lot more that goes into biology. It could be everything from uh, growth of breasts or uh, secondary hair growth, or um, 
chromosomes or hormones. There's all kinds of different varieties of being in the world, even when it comes to your physical body. So there's a lot more variety than we think when we're only looking at two boxes. And then there's the concept of gender expression. So it's kind of pointing at everything. And it has to do with how you show up in the world and what people can see on you. So the way that you like to dress, the way that you like to speak, the mannerisms that you use, uh, the way you cross your legs or you don't, um, how much you smile. These are all ways that you express your gender. Now the thing is, your gender expression doesn't actually have to do with the way that you identify. And that's where we're bringing in gender identity. And this is pointing at a brain because you cannot know gender identity until you ask somebody. So you might say, um, I'm seeing this person wearing a dress and makeup and earrings. Um, can I assume that they identify as a woman? And that's that assumption part that you want to start getting away from and recognizing that it's really not a good idea to try to guesstimate people's identity. So we want to separate behavior or visual cues from identity because they don't always match. In fact, they don't often match. So there are days in which I'm feeling more femi, in which right now I'm wearing makeup and earrings and jewelry. Um, and there's days in which I'm feeling more masculine and I'm really interested in wearing my really baggy sweatpants and my t-shirt and my jeans and my torn up sneakers. Um, that is gender expression separate, differentiated from gender identity. When it comes to gender identity, it has to do with how people feel on the inside of who they are, how this comes to the way they identify. So uh, an example that I heard recently that I thought was interesting was if somebody with a penis uh, who identified as male um, was in an accident and um, their penis had to be amputated, they would still likely identify as male. So we want to get away from genitalia as identity. We're trying to actually kind of separate things out to say that there's a lot more variety possible. So you could have one way of expressing yourself, something in a different gender identity that doesn't match with this, and this notion of matching is tricky, and a whole different set of genitals. So my identity is about how I feel, my expression has to do with how I show up in the world, how people perceive me, and uh, my genitalia have to do with how I was assigned at birth. Um, that's a nice basic understanding. Now when it comes to orientation or attraction, this has to do with who I love and who I'm attracted to sexually and who I want to partner with. So these previous ones that we talked about were more about me and this orientation and attraction one has to do with more who I want to connect with. And so now we're bringing a separate, separate person. Um, we had, let's see, we had this concept of same sex in which we would say a same-sex relationship would be one in which I, Jimena, um, am a woman who, I, uh, who was assigned female at birth, um, who is attracted to people of all genders, and that's actually me, I'm pansexual. Um, sometimes we used to call that bisexual. Um, we might say that I was attracted to somebody of the same sex if I was attracted to a woman who was assigned female at birth. This is where it's going to start getting much trickier. Um, I'm going to put this down for a minute. When it comes to attraction, if we say same sex, we might think we know what we mean. We might say, oh, he men is a woman, she's attracted to women, she has the same sex attraction, same sex relationship. The thing about it is, are we talking about the gender identity, the gender expression, or the genitalia when we say that? because we just made it a lot more complicated a minute ago with this gender person. So if I happen to be attracted to somebody who had a vulva, so who was assigned female at birth, um, and who uh, expressed themselves in a very masculine way and wore um, plaid button-down shirts uh, with big heavy shoes, um, and wore their hair really short and wore no makeup, so they were expressing themselves in a pretty masculine way, um, and identified as female, would that be a same-sex relationship? Or would it be an opposite-sex relationship? Hmm. Or what if they identified as male and were presenting in an androgynous way and had a vulva? Is that a same-sex relationship or is that an opposite-sex relationship? 
or what if I happen to be attracted to a trans woman uh, who express themselves in a very feminine way and identified as feminine and we don't need to know about genitalia because really none of my business. Um, do we consider that a same-sex relationship or an opposite-sex relationship? And what I'm trying to get at here is that the boxes that we used to work with no longer fit. We start to throw them away and recognize that sameness and opposite is a binary system. This notion that there's only two possibilities of being in the world. And we're trying to get away from that binary system and saying there's a lot more variety in the world. What about the non-binary folks? The non-binary folks are the folks who don't necessarily want to fit into either one of the two boxes. And they might say, sometimes I feel, sometimes I identify as female, sometimes I identify as male, and often I identify as neither. And that is a perfectly wonderful, amazing way of showing up in the world. What we want to get to is recognizing that the system that we had in place that we thought kept us so safe and made things so simple, um, really we're kind of getting away from and saying we want to give a lot more flexibility for how people want to show up in the world because those two boxes that we had for a very long time were pretty oppressive. That's a basic start. Um, as we're start to, starting to unlearn the socialization that we've been encultured into, so people have been teaching us and training us into how we're supposed to be in the world, everything from how to cross our legs to how to speak to what volume we use. We've been trained on all kinds of things about what is appropriate and what is not. And we're starting to question and say, we don't really want to follow those norms anymore. There's an activity that I do with my students that I find really valuable that I'll have to tell you about because I don't have students here or a blackboard to do it in. Um, but I will describe the experience to you and um, hopefully this will give you an idea of what that's like. Okay. So this is an activity that we do pretty early on in the term in which we talk about um, the different experiences that we have showing up in the world. Um, I divide up the board into two. I make a nice little line down the middle and I write on one side men and on the other side women and I apologize because it's an oversimplified binary system and I say, y'all, it's day one of class. Bear with me. We're going to start simple and make it more complicated as we go. One side men, the other side women. <clears throat> and I say, okay, to all of the men in the room, people who identify as male and are perceived to be male uh, when you walk out into the world, tell me the kinds of things that you do almost every single day or at least three times a week um, to make sure that you are not assal assaulted sexually or harassed sexually. So in order to avoid rape, what kind of things do you do almost every day? And I wait. And of course, there's awkward silence and giggles and nervousness. And somebody eventually calls out. And usually what I hear is some version of, I don't have to think about it. And I check in with folks and they say, yeah, that's pretty much it. And so I write on the board, I don't have to think about it. And then now I ask to all the folks in the room who identify as female, and are perceived to be female uh, when you walk out into the world. Tell me the kinds of things that you have to do almost every day, or at least a few times every week, to make sure that you are not raped or sexually harassed. And we go through the list, and you can imagine that that list fills up. I'll try to do my best to tell you about some of them, but I'm gonna skip a bunch. Um, let's see, weapons. My students have reported carrying mace, knives, sometimes guns, carrying their keys in their hands to use as a weapon, uh, when they're walking to their car, uh, being always on alert, checking behind them, checking the back of their car, checking under their car, making sure that they park in a spot that is uh, not separated, so not so far away from everybody else. Um, they ask a buddy to walk with them to the car. Um, when it comes to dating, they'll never meet somebody they don't know uh, in a private location. They always make sure it's in a public location. Um, they have all kinds of people checking up on them. They tell people where they're going, what time they're expected back. They text them while they're on the date. They text them after the date. Um, they have a panic system in which if I don't report back by this time, make sure that you do this or that. Um, as they're walking down the street, they make sure to make eye contact, to seem menacing, or never make eye contact, looking down to not 
uh, allow for interaction with people on the street. Um, they tell me that they wear their headphones in to make sure that they seem unapproachable. And then they tell me that they never put their headphones in so that they can be alert and listening. So my students tell me about all of these things that they have to do all the time just to make sure that they're staying safe from rape and sexual harassment. The part that's really overwhelming is that we end up with a board that's half full and half empty. As we look at the board, there's one side that says, I don't have to think about it, and the other side is visually packed. It's crammed with all of these things that have to happen all of the time that in many cases we've learned to do automatically. We've been trained at this for so long that we don't even notice them. So we have a moment in which we stare at this board and say, what do we see here? And we talk about how we live in very different worlds depending on whether people are perceiving us as male or female. And that's how they interact with us in the world. If we're going through life from a male perspective in which people perceive us as male, we're going to have all kinds of perks because we don't even have to think about all this stuff. When we're going through life as a woman or perceived as a woman, we're going through life having to deal with all of these things that have to happen all of the time. So if we think about how much attention and brain space and bandwidth all of these behaviors take up, like, there could be so many more things that you could be doing with your brain than a hundred different things all of the time just to have some basic safety. If we could imagine doing other things with our brain, we could think about just not being afraid all the time. My students talk about a generalized sense of fear, and this is in their own words, and how we've trained ourselves to no longer even want the things. We don't even think about it anymore. Like for example, if I asked them, um, if I were to offer you an amazing, incredible job uh, that you would love with all of your favorite people in it um, and wonderful conditions, and it was your dream scenario, the one thing that it had was that you had to take public transportation at two in the morning every single day to get to work and back. Would you take that job? And my students usually say they would not. And I ask them, would you even send in your resume? if you knew that those were the conditions. And usually they say they would not. And here's the tricky thing is that just by virtue of being male, there's gonna end up being a lot more resumes that are male on that pile for that job. That means that the males got a boost when it came to that job just because they felt a little bit safer moving through life and they, could, they figured they could handle that. When it comes to being female, they never even got to apply for that job, and so they were at a disadvantage. And here's the thing, when we're talking about how somebody has an advantage and somebody doesn't, we're not talking about them being mean, evil people, right? These guys that got their resume on that table, on that application, um, they're not the mean, sexist people, we're not saying that they're horrible monster pigs, we're just saying that by virtue of being male, they just had it a little bit easier, which gave them a boost into getting that job. That makes it much, much easier to go through life. Now, if I had asked the guys in the room, not the kind of stuff that they did uh, in terms of rape and sexual harassment, but the things that they think that women do, they would likely be able to tell me maybe three, five, maybe ten things. Like they might say, okay, um, watch your drink and don't go alone and don't wear the skirt, right? They might know like three things, but they can't tell me 80 and they can't tell me 100 because they don't know what it's like, like to live that all the time. They don't know what it feels like in their body to be trying to do 100 things all of the time just for basic safety. What I'm trying to get at here is that they may have heard this concept of sexism, right? They know it's, it's around, they've heard about it, but they don't get it, get it. And this exercise is pretty important for my students because many, many of them at the end of the term tell me that this is a point when they realized that there was a lot of stuff that they didn't understand and that it was important for them to trust and believe and say, there's things that I'm not going to be able to see. That's kind of what I'm trying to get at with this exercise is there are things that you will not be able to see when you have power and privilege. Now the tricky thing is when it comes to intersectionality, is you're going to find yourself on different sides of a phenomenon depending on where you're at. So in class we could call it kind of which side of the board are you on? Are you on the blank and ignorant side in which you really you don't get it? 
not through meanness, not through evilness, just you cannot understand this phenomenon? Or are you on the side that has been doing a million things for all of the time and is completely exhausted? Which side of the board are you on? And this one is just for sexism. Now, as soon as we talk about racism, you might find yourself on a different side of the board. So if you're a white woman, you understand sexism really well. But when it comes to racism, you're going to get on that ignorant side and say, Eesh, I know I've heard about racism. I know it's, it's out there. Like, you might be able to name like two, three things, but not 80 and not 100 and not what it feels like to do all of these things all of the time. When it comes to transphobia, if you're cisgender, you might have all the best intentions in the world, but you absolutely cannot understand what it feels like to show up as a trans person and have people read that on you. You will never, ever understand it. So I, as a cis person, talking to a group of trans folks, am completely at a dis... No, I won't say at a disadvantage. That's a tricky word. I apologize. I'm, I'm completely ignorant of the phenomenon. I can try to educate myself about it, and I do. I, I strive to seek out information all the time, but I will never, ever understand it. So the thing here is, is to figure out when it comes to each phenomenon, which side of the board are you on? Are you on the blank side or are you on the exhausted side? This is really important because what I'm trying to train my students to do is if they find themselves on that blank side, on that power and privilege side, I want them to have trust, to believe, to give the benefit of the doubt by saying, there's going to be stuff I'm going to miss. There's going to be stuff I cannot understand. And so I'm going to need to trust the experts when it comes to this phenomenon because I'm really, really ignorant. So I'm hoping that men, when it comes to sexism, will say, I really don't understand sexism. When a woman is speaking about sexism, it's going to be really important that I sit back and listen. Otherwise, I'm going to miss a bunch of stuff. When it comes to privilege, we can define privilege as um, an unearned advantage. So privilege is an advantage that you didn't earn through a skill or through something you did. It's something that was kind of gifted to you in life more based on your identities, on who you were when you were born, or how the world perceives you right now. So it has nothing to do with your merits or your skills, it has more to do with your identities. And so you get a boost, or you either get a boost or a push down based on these identities. So let's make it a little bit simpler. One of the things I like to say about an advantage is that an advantage is that you have life easier than, or harder than. It's no absolute. So we're not going to say your life is easy, but we're going to say it's easier then. So we could say that being poor is hard. It's really hard. Being poor and black is harder. This is what's called intersectionality. As we talk about how different identities connect and intersect, we'll talk about how accumulating a few different identities will either make your life much easier or much harder. Let's talk about, for example, me and language. It's always a comparison. It's never an absolute, right? We've said easier than, harder than. So English is not my first language. It's my second language. So if I were to compare, right, always comparing, if I were to compare myself to a native English speaker, their life is much, much easier than mine. Um, they don't get tongue-tied in the same way that I do. Um, I come up with weird phrasing all the time. I have to second guess myself. I have to ask my colleagues sometimes to check my documents to make sure that I didn't put in any weird um, phrasing. Um, um, they'll come up with words a little bit easier. Um, that, let's do that, All right? So compared to a native English speaker, their life is easier than mine. Now, comparing myself to somebody who's much newer to English than I am, my life is so much, so much easier than theirs. I show up in this country with a relatively small accent and often not recognizable as an accent. Um, therefore, I'm given a lot more credibility. I'm considered a lot smarter. So, so people with an accent are often perceived to be slow or dumb or as if they're not understanding. Um, they're going to have a much harder time coming up with the words that they want to say or even being taken seriously. So we're always doing a comparison, right? Easier, easier than, harder than. 
It's never an absolute. That's kind of a basic understanding of what privilege is. And we want to keep coming back to this because we want to be really aware of where we're situated with each phenomenon. And now the fun thing is, is that intersectionality has us think about a lot of different identities. Is on some of them, we're going to be on that blank side of the board, right? On that power side that has a bunch of benefits. On some of them, we're going to be on the harder side, on the much, much harder level when we're dealing with oppressions. So for example, in my case, I am a woman, so I'm on the harder oppressed side of sexism, um, but I am currently able-bodied, um, and so I'm on the much, much easier side of the game. I don't even have to think about how many steps I have to walk up and down to get into a room because I am not currently in a wheelchair, so that doesn't even have to cross my mind. When it comes to uh, sexual orientation, I'm on the oppressed side of the spectrum because I'm pansexual and have partnered with women and uh, genderqueer folks at different points in my life. Um, my life is much harder than somebody who is heterosexual and cisgender. Um, uh, I count myself as cisgender, so I am on this side of the board. My life is much, much easier than somebody who is trans. I get all kinds of perks through life because people could perceive me to be normal and acceptable in these ways. So we're always doing the multiplicity of it all and recognizing that we show up in the world with a whole bunch of different identities that aren't just one. So whichever phenomenon you're thinking and talking about, make sure that you're pretty clear on where you're standing for each. We tend to have um, a misunderstanding when it comes to oppression. Um, we tend to think that the people who benefit from an oppression are doing it out of meanness, right? We have these notions of somebody who is racist is somebody who thinks of themselves as better and who tells mean racist jokes. So it has to do, we think it has a lot to do with intention. So rather than saying, are you racist or are you not? A better question might be, do you recognize that you benefit from racism? Do you benefit from racism? And that question might get us some much more interesting answers in recognizing, yeah, I benefit from racism and literally me. I am an immigrant from Costa Rica. So I am, I am literally an immigrant. Uh, my life has been complicated with immigration issues in so very many ways. Um, my country is one of the countries that was ransacked and had uh, loot taken out of it. So I'm from the, one of the poorer countries. My life is very hard and yet my life is much easier than many other folks. For example, when it comes to racism, I am technically a brown person. I'm an immigrant. However, I'm a very light-skinned brown person. So when a cop pulls me over, I am not afraid for my life. Not really. And a cop is not going to be likely to be jumpy around me and is likely going to give me a much better uh, chance and so a lot more benefit of the doubt and treat me in a much better way than if I had much, much darker skin. So recognizing that even though I don't mean to, and I'm not trying to, and I don't want to, I absolutely benefit from racism, even as I'm also hurt by it. That's that complexity that we're trying to get to. Remember the example of the job with the bus at two in the morning, right? Where we said the guys would put in their resumes and the women would not. We're not saying that these are mean, sexist, evil guys who tell evil, sexist jokes. We're just saying that we recognize that the structures that have been built give them a boost up and make it easier for them to get a lot of little perks through life. This is what we're looking at is these structures. We want to get away from this notion of intention and superiority and um, being aware. Um, we tend to think of prejudice as something that people do meanly and intentionally. And we want to start moving into recognizing that it has nothing to do with intention. In some cases it does, but mostly it doesn't. And has a lot more to do with structures and the, the way that we've set up our society. This basic misunderstanding helps us kind of, let's see, if we have an understanding of racism as something that the mean racist people do willingly and on purpose, then we get to kind of check out and say, since I'm not intentionally thinking that I'm superior, then all I need to do is just not think that way and then I'm good and fine. That makes you be, sometimes we call it non-racist, and there's a great video that I love um, that focuses on this. This would make us think that we're non-racist and so that we can just kind of check out and not worry about it anymore. But we want to get to the point where we get to be anti-racist and say, 
I'm not comfortable with benefiting from a system that is unfairly based on skin color. I'm just not comfortable. Even though I don't want to, right? We said I don't want to be benefiting from this. I recognize that I am. So it's really important to me and my ethics to make sure that I'm helping to break that system. That's where I want to step into the anti-racist role. So moving away from a passive non-racist role of saying, not my problem, as long as I'm not saying mean things and not doing mean things on purpose, then I'm cool and fine, into the active anti-racist mode of saying, I want to help stop this because I don't want to keep benefiting or contributing to a system that is horribly based on race. Likewise, when it comes to trans issues, since I'm cisgender, I get a lot of perks and benefits in the world that I really shouldn't be getting just for being cisgender. So it's really important to me that I help out and that I help to break the system of transphobia. We tend to think about this, and this is an idea that's not mine. I got this idea from Jay Smooth and a wonderful TED Talk that I find really inspiring, and I, I use this with my students. We have this idea that um, prejudice is something, again, that you're aware of, um, that you do meanly and on purpose, um, and that you can have it removed and be done with it. We, he talks about the example as tonsils. So saying, oh, no, I had my sexism removed back in 2010 when I took that women's studies class. I am good and done. Check. Finished. Completed. I took that one course. I'm all good. Instead of thinking of this as an all or nothing, you either are or you aren't, we want to start thinking about oppression and, for example, sexism as something that you need to get at all the time. It's a practice that needs upkeep. So he says, think about it in terms of toothbrushing, not tonsils. So this would mean that this is something that you keep having to check on all the time, that your anti-sexism work is something that you keep doing all the time if you're a male. So he says, um, what happens if you find a little bit, bit of spinach in your teeth? If you're stuck in this absolute all or nothing meanness thing, uh, if somebody says to you, hey, you have a little bit of spinach stuck in your teeth, you might get huffy and defensive and pissy and say, are you saying I'm an unclean person? Are you saying I'm unhygienic? And you get yourself all pissy because you would say, it's like, are you saying that I purposely put spinach in my teeth and I'm doing this? So we recognize how that doesn't make any sense. We want to step back and say, oh, no, I'm not saying you're an unclean person. I'm just saying that there's a little something that needs some upkeep that you want to take into account, that you want to pay attention to. So in your sexism work, you just got a little spinach in your teeth. You just made a mistake. You want to be ready and eager and willing to have somebody let you know about the spinach in the teeth instead of getting huffy and puffy and saying, I am not unclean or unhygienic. My students really love this example because it gets them unstuck when they're feeling like somebody has let them know that they've done something wrong. Instead of getting huffy and puffy, you actually want to be told. You want to be the person that gets told about the spinach in the teeth. Otherwise, you're walking around looking like a fool. Now, it can be really embarrassing when somebody lets you know that you've made a mistake or that you have spinach in your teeth. Like, you kind of want to go and hide and, and, and a little mortified. That's okay. That's, that's a feeling that is perfectly normal to have. You want to move past that pretty fast so that you can actually get the information you need. Because if somebody says to you, you have spinach in your teeth and you just run away, you're still missing information that you need, like, which tooth is it on? And did I get it? So you actually want to be eager for this information and asking more about it. So when somebody lets you know, hey, you just said something sexist, you actually want to find out, oh my God, I'm embarrassed. It's mortifying. Can you let me know what it was? I really appreciate it. And can you, can you check me? Did I get it all of it? Like, did I get the right tooth? This kind of willingness to be told is really important. So if you start showing up in the world and telling people, oh my God, when I make a mistake like this, could you please let me know? Cause I don't be, I don't want to be walking around like a fool. And then people will actually take the time and energy that it takes to educate you. When somebody lets you know that you've made a mistake in terms of social justice, it's actually a really big gift. They're letting you know that they trust you to actually want to do better and to try doing better. There's been many, many cases in which I see people say something horribly racist and sexist and homophobic, and I just really, I don't get into it. Like, I would rather just let them sit with it because I'm not going to take that risk.
For those particular categories, these are categories in which I am part of the oppressed group. And so I don't want to put in the time and energy that goes into training them on this particular stuff. Now the thing is, there's this concept called an ally. So let's define an ally. An ally would be somebody who's on the blank side of the board, somebody who has a lot of privilege and power, so men, um, who is trying to break the system that benefits them. So it'd be men against sexism, or white people against racism, or cis people against transphobia. So it's somebody who doesn't really get the phenomenon, right? We said, they're pretty ignorant. They really kind of don't know, right? I don't have to think about it. They don't get it. They're getting a boost from it. And yet, they're trying to break it and saying, I don't want to keep benefiting from the system. It feels really shitty. This is not a good thing to be. And I want to make sure that I'm not getting any extra advantages that I don't deserve. So they're actively, all the time, working on breaking the system. So this is kind of a very basic understanding of ally. Remember, you're going to be on different categories depending on which identity we're talking about. One of the important things about an ally is recognizing this absolute ignorance that you have. Right? You're standing on the blank side of the board, you really don't get it, you've heard about this thing, but you don't really know it. And there's a lot of stuff you're, you're going to completely miss. So that basic willingness and eagerness to be educated is a really, really important ally skill and saying, please, please, please let me know when there's spinach in my teeth because I really don't want to be walking around looking like a fool. The thing about mistakes is, since we know that you don't know, we know you're gonna make a mistake. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. You're gonna make a million of them. If people know that you're trustworthy enough that they can actually believe you to really want to learn, and that you're not going to take it out against them when they actually take the time to educate you, then they'll be a little bit more likely to want to educate you. So they'll give you that information that you need. So make sure that that's how you're showing up in the world, that you're actively telling folks, please let me know if I've made a mistake. That humility, that willing, willingness to learn is one of the most important ally skills that we can have. Um, something to think about when it comes to ally work is, we know that allies don't know, right? Because we know that they're coming from the powerful side. We also know that they're really important because they have a lot of access to power. And so we want to make sure that they're using their credibility to speak and call attention to the folks that are uh, not being heard. So for example, when we have white folks saying, listen to the brown folks, they're talking about racism and what they're saying is important. Not trying to take the spotlight themselves, but pointing and saying, Go look at what they're doing. That's really important. Giving all kinds of support. These are really good, important, basic ally skills. So this is something that we recommend, for example, for cisgender folks when it comes to supporting trans folks and to end transphobia. We want to think about the terms of solidarity. So solidarity is when we are supporting something that isn't our problem. So we are trying to make sure to care about somebody else's needs and, sh and help them as they're going through life. That help word is a little tricky, but that's kind of a basic understanding. What I tell my students is, um, I am a queer Latina immigrant in Portland, Oregon. If I needed to get a group of queer Latina immigrants in Portland, Oregon, and we were going to go march down to City Hall and demand our, demand our rights, there's not that many of us. Like, there's like 15 of us in the city or 20 of us. There's really not that many of us. So we don't have the numbers necessary in order to actually make the change happen because there's really not that many of us. So I'm going to need to reach out to people who are not just in my group. I'm going to need to reach out to the Latina folks and say, hey Latina folks, can you help me with this problem that I'm having? Can you show up for me? And Latina folks are going to have to show up for something that isn't their problem specifically. The thing is, I'm going to need to educate them and say, hey, y'all, watch out for this because you're being kind of homophobic as you're doing that. And recognizing that since I'm bringing folks in from outside the phenomenon, they're not going to get it and they're going to make mistakes. Likewise, I may need to bring in my queer and white allies and say, hey, queer white people, can you come help me out because I need some help with this. There will be more of us, but it's more likely that the queer white folks that come and help me out are going to make some pretty racist mistakes. So I'm going to have to take the time to educate them and say, hey, this is really annoying. you got to stop that. 
So knowing that I have to bring in folks from other groups is part of how we create social change. And that intersectionality, that notion that all of these identities connect, is really important as we say, we're gonna have to show up for each other, not just for ourselves, because there's not enough just of us to actually make an impact. So if I wait until I only have the exact group of people who are just exactly like me, I don't have enough people and I don't have enough strength to change the world. Keep in mind that we know, as I'm bringing folks in from other groups, that I know they're going to make mistakes, so I'm, I'm ready for the mistakes being made. That doesn't mean I brush them off. It does mean I need to educate them. And it does mean that they need to be absolutely ready and eager to be educated on the mistakes that they're making, right? Remember, you want to be the person that gets told about the spinach. Otherwise, you're walking around looking like a fool. This is all part of how we show up for each other and help change the world. And we want to make sure that we recognize that these mistakes are going to happen because they're really, really common. And we want to be really eager to be told because it'll actually help us stay in the fight longer. If we get really huffy and puffy whenever somebody lets us know that we've made a mistake, we're more likely to just kind of want to quit and say, oh, those people, oh my God, seriously, there's no winning with them. They're just so demanding and they're so mean and they, they, they get angry and they see all these horrible things. I don't want to help them out. They're not even nearly grateful enough for me. Whenever you're stuck in that position, make sure that you think about that other group. So for example, if you're trans and white, make sure that you think about how when people are telling you that you've just said something racist, make sure that you think of what you would want to have the cisgender folks do, right? We know that they're going to make a lot of transphobic mistakes. We want to be really ready to be able to talk about the mistakes. We, as a community, we're starting to get ready to make this a part of our language. When we get specifically into uh, cisgender issues and heterosexual issues, as we're speaking specifically about homophobia and transphobia and heterosexism and cissexism, as we're thinking about these dynamics, we want to start thinking about all the ways that we've not made space for people to be present in the world, that we've had them silence who they are. Um, I want to bring up some terminology to make sure that we're all on the same page. So when we say queer, queer is a term that has been reclaimed. It's a word that used to be used uh, for insulting, for saying that you are weird and unacceptable and odd. Um, and it was a slur, specifically a hate term. Um, that term has been reclaimed by the community and has been taken up with pride. So saying, you're saying I'm weird? It's like, Yes, I am. I am queer and proud of it. So the dynamic that has uh, come along for queer issues has been a lot about shame and secrecy and saying, oh, you need to keep this quiet. Nobody needs to know about this. And folks have come out and saying, I am me and I am proud and I am present and you will not make me hide. So taking that and kind of shoving it back is a great way to go. Um, queer now is used as an umbrella term. So it is used to encompass, so to cover all kinds of different identities. And it's useful because it lets us uh, create kind of some unity. So recognizing that we all have a shared set of, a shared origin of oppression, which is these rigid gender norms uh, in which we say you can only show up with your gender expression in this way and you can only like this kind of people. We recognize that there's a lot of things that we have in common that uh, we could be joining up together on. And so saying we are queer, we share stuff. Um, it's also a really useful term because it is a nice short term that you can quickly grab on when you're trying to make a point and when you're trying to speak generally. There's some problems with it um, in that it erases all the different identities that are under the umbrella. So the alphabet soup, right? So as we start saying LGBTQQIA2S, pan, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's coming under that umbrella. Some folks get really anxious and really confused and really worried and saying, I don't understand all those terms and I don't know what they are and they get really nervous and freaked out by it when really Google can help you out in just a couple seconds. Like, I don't know what pansexual is. Like, why don't you Google it? You'll find out real fast. Um, I don't know what demisexual is. Try Googling it. Um, the thing is, um, we've only offered people, right, the two boxes, the two rigid gender binary boxes in which you are a man, you like women, you are blue. In which you are a woman, you are pink, you are tender, you like men, right? These two boxes, this only way of being in the world. 
And we're saying we want a lot more variety. There's a lot more ways of being. And we're starting to come out and saying, I have my own identity and it's actually different from that one. So we'd say we could start simpler by saying, well, homosexual, right? Same sex attraction. Saying well, actually there's also bisexual and saying I'm actually attracted to two genders. And then they're saying pansexual is I'm actually attracted to all of the genders. Gender isn't the big part in who I choose to partner with. Um, there's all these different terms that are coming out and saying, I'm, I'm here, don't erase me, don't silence me, I wanna be present. So the alphabet soup keeps growing as people are recognizing and saying, there's some stuff that we have in common, but this identity is mine and it's different from that other one. And I wanna talk about that. I wanna talk about how being bi and pan is very different than being homosexual or heterosexual and how being rejected from both communities can be really painful. Having your own letter and then having it be taken away and squashed under a great big giant Q is a problem. Because sometimes we really need more LG, maybe a little B, but often not a lot of T. So when we say LGBT, we're really talking LG, B, and T. <laughs> so folks are saying, stop pushing us out and our dynamics and our phenomenons are not the same. So make sure that you are at least making sure that we're present and visible and hearing our, us out. That's a bit on terminology, just broadly and generally. And I'll say for more specific stuff, go ahead and get into uh, some Googling. You may be a little overwhelmed and remember, this is you having a little bit of a panic moment. Stay chill and learn because this is a better way of helping you interact with folks that you'll meet and saying, I don't know what non-binary is and I don't know how to use they pronouns and I keep making mistakes. Remember, we know you're gonna make mistakes. The really important part is that you're actively trying to learn and really eager to be told when you need that there's something, when you, there's something that you need to improve on. We're gonna talk specifically about the dynamics of queer oppression, and I'm gonna speak generally. And again, remember, there's a lot of different dynamics within each of these. I'm gonna speak generally about some stuff that a lot of the alphabet soup folks, a lot of the rainbow crowd share. Um, not all, not in all ways, but some stuff we have can be kind of similar. So it might help us connect within our group. Um, and we can get into a lot more specifics about each of the identities and each of the dynamics, but I wanna kind of start with the broad sense. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the patterns of oppression work, um, the things that can be kind of similar across different ones. And it's gonna take us a little bit. First of all, we're gonna start by talking stereotypes. The thing about stereotypes is that they are really ugly when you say them out loud. The stuff that's floating around, that's kind of part of the culture around you, but usually it's not said in words. When it's said in words, it sounds really, really nasty. However, I would say sometimes it's better having it in words than just having it float around and not have it be admitted to and just acted on. So a lot of the stereotypes that we've had about queer folks is that we are dangerous, that we are sexually uh, um, promiscuous, that we are sexually aggressive, that we are out to convert everybody, um, that the way that we interact sexually with the world and present ourselves in our gender expression is wrong, uh, unhealthy, uh, punishable, um, uh, it's been criminal, it still is criminal in many ways, etc. For example, I asked my students, um, in this country, in the United States, currently in 2017, is it legal, legal, to fire somebody for being gay? Not having to cover it up, like your, your firing letter would say, I am firing you because you are gay. Is it legal to do that? And I say, and a lot of times I say, no, no, that's completely illegal. And we step back and say, actually, it is legal. How many states is this legal in? And they have absolutely no idea. The part that's really scary is that currently you can be fired legally for being gay in 28 states. So in the majority of the country, you can be fired for your sexual orientation. There's no protection against it. Here's the fun part is you know somebody who is out and queer and therefore where I work, I have to, I'm sorry, where I live, I have to make decisions about what I'm gonna do based on where I wanna work. So I can't go to Texas and teach my class in the same way 
and be out and proud in the same way that I can in Oregon. Oregon gives me protections that Tennessee doesn't. I have to make life decisions about where I live based on my sexual orientation, which is something that heterosexual folks don't often have to do. They don't have to think about it, right? It doesn't have to enter their mind. I actually had to migrate out of my country. I had to leave Costa Rica specifically because of homophobia. So my life has been very much marked by homophobia and the, uh, the experiences I've had for being pansexual have marked me in ways that are pretty oppressive. As we're starting to think through this stuff and we start to name the stereotypes, we want to look into, let's start by defining stereotype. A stereotype, generally speaking, is um, a widely held belief about a group of people. So widely held is really important. That means that a lot of people would share it. Not everybody, not in all the ways, but it's something that's kind of been talked about. Like, for example, if I were to say women are bad drivers and women are bad at math, you may not agree with that, but it's an idea that you've heard and that's been repeated around you socially. Everything from little girl t-shirts that say, algebra is hard, to um, news reporters making a joke. Right? It's something that's around you socially. You may not believe it, but you've heard it. All right. As I start to name stereotypes about uh, non-heterosexual cisgender folks, they're gonna start to sound really, really nasty. But I wanna go through the exercise of saying them out loud first so that we can hear them, and then so we can actually start to figure out how to take that apart. So, queer folks have been labeled criminal, have been punished uh, with violence, have been jailed, have been killed, um, have been told that we are um, ill, therefore that we need um, all kinds of torture treatments, um, that we are sexually aggressive and out to convert everybody, that we are sexually promiscuous and can't have monogamous relationships uh, and assuming that monogamous is the way to go, um, that we are out to convert others and that it's contagious and that people will be queer if they spend too much time around us. Um, Specifically, let's talk transgender folks. So transphobia says that trans folks are absolutely dangerous. They are perverts, they are deviant, that they are uh, confused, that they are trying to get away with stuff, that they are not to be trusted, that they're deceitful, that they're liars. Remember, this sounds really ugly coming out of my mouth. That's why I'm saying it. So this will get you feeling all kinds of ways. This is why we're doing this. These are the things that are often not said out loud in words. Some of the nastier people do say them out loud, but a lot of times we, we don't see them said this directly. Since we know the content of the stereotype, so this, the, the content of the story of the, that is told about, this, about us, this is where we can start to say, these are the stories that we want to counteract and start to take apart. So if I were to say, um, I'm a cisgender person, and as we're thinking about privilege, right? So, I'm cisgender, I've got privilege, I'm on the power side of this. If transgender folks are believed to be um, liars and untrustworthy, then just by being cisgender, I am considered to be a little bit more trustworthy and a little bit less of a liar. Um, if uh, transgender folks are considered to be aberrant and defective and icky and yuck, Remember, horrible stereotypes. If trans folks are considered to be that, then I, by virtue of being cisgender, am considered to be fine and okay and normal and attractive, right? This is what we're doing with this dynamic is recognizing that the stereotypes we have about one group that hurt them give the other group a boost up. Always keep this in mind. We want to think about the fact that how we interact with folks with less powers. How are we interacting with le lesbian, gay, uh, pansexual, bi bisexual folks? Uh, these are the orientation ones. Uh, when we're talking about the identity ones, we're talking transgender folks, non-binary folks, gender non-conforming folks. If we're thinking about how we interact with them, there's been ways that we make the world much harder for them through structures, right? We don't allow them to offer insurance to their partners. We don't allow them to talk about their partners at work. We don't allow them to uh, get the medical care that they need. Um, as we create structures that hurt them, we are also basing this on a really strong layer of social exclusion. So the thing about 
transphobia is that it isn't about the, ba about the bathrooms. It's about excluding trans folks. It's about keeping them out of public spaces. Because if you can't pee, then you can't leave the house. Because you have to stay within an hour's worth of getting back to the house so you can pee. This is about keeping po folks down. Just like when it came to racism, it was never about the water fountains. It was always about excluding them socially. So when it comes to um, a check, so figuring out where you're at with a dynamic, if you're on the power side and the privilege side, you might ask yourself, would this be an identity that I would wish on my child? Would this be an identity that I would wish my child to marry? So for example, would I want to have a trans daughter? Um, or would I want my daughter to marry a trans woman? And if you're a little weird about it and a little icky about it, you know that there's a lot more work that you need to do. Because if your answer isn't, hell yes, then there's some stuff still stuck in your head. And this is perfectly normal. This is, right, we've been taught these stereotypes, these widely held beliefs got into our own heads. But it takes quite a bit of work to start picking them out a little bit at a time. So this is a, a pattern that you want to get yourself into. How do I feel about this phenomenon? Would I want it really close to my heart in my child or a partner? As we're thinking about some of the patterns that have to do with queer oppressions, we want to start recognizing that a lot of times these oppressions are not shared from parent to child. So, for example, when it comes to race issues, racism, um, since this is an, an identity that's handed down from parent to child, often, um, there's a dynamic in which parents will understand what children are going through just a little bit and can be able to train them a little bit on how to interact, for example, with the police. This is a, a phenomenon in which your parents really may not get it at all. And so this interrupts what is considered a normal uh, parental cycle, so normal life cycle development. This creates some very horrible dynamics within a household. When you have somebody in your household who has a lot of power over you and they get to decide a bunch of stuff for you, they can use their power in some really, really horrible ways. So I have my students think through what kind of things parents can do to children when they want them to obey. And the answer gets pretty bleak. There are parents who try to abuse their power and use horrible tactics of abuse and control in order to make sure that their kids aren't queer and to force them into the shape that they want to be. So they do horrible things like literally withholding food and inflicting pain or withholding clothing um, because they want to push folks into being a certain shape or a certain way. This can be really cruel because these are the folks who are, are meant to shape you and help you in the world. So when you're a little kid and it's your own parents that are telling you that you are deformed, that you're an abomination, that you are sick and evil and cruel, when these are the folks who are shaping you, this stuff really gets into your head. Internalized oppression is a really horrible dynamic um, that has you actually believe what the oppressor is saying about you. So um, the best example I have for internalized homophobia specifically came from um, a friend of my first girlfriend. Um, and it was about 20 years old. I was at a party and he and I were hanging out and talking and he asked me, if um, the first kiss that I, that I had with her was actually my first kiss with a woman. And I said, yeah. And he asked, well, how was it? And I said, it was kind of sexy and kind of fun. And I said, no, no, but like, how did you feel? I was like, oh, uh, well, I guess I felt kind of nervous and kind of excited and kind of nervous and it was kind of fun. And, but no, like, but, but how did you feel? And at that point, I said, I was like, I, I think I'm not understanding you. Like, what are you asking me? And he said, the first time I kissed a guy, I spent the whole night crying and puking. So this was heartbreaking to me because for him, his first kiss with a guy wasn't exciting or sexy. It was terrifying. It was horrible. It was awful because it was him finally not being able to hold out anymore. He'd been trying to push the gay part of himself away for decades and trying to make sure that he never gave into it until finally he couldn't hold out anymore. 
this internalized depression in which you actually believe what people are saying about you, that it is horrible to be gay, that it is defective and unnatural and sick, you will actually start to believe it if the right people tell it to you at the right time. It takes a lot of time and energy and help to be able to unlearn this stuff. And this is something that folks who haven't gone through this internalized process, who've, who haven't been so isolated, may not have to go through in the same way. Something that's tricky about these oppressions, the oppressions that come from within a household. Um, and another example of this would be um, people with psychiatric diagnoses. Uh, people with disabilities are living in households where they may be the only person with a disability. Um, sexism is one in which you have uh, a parent that can control a child, so you can have a father controlling a daughter in a very specific way. So when you have oppressor and oppressed, so target and agent, when you have them within one household, the dynamics of control and abuse can be much, much different than from outside a household. Part of the problem with these kinds of, of oppressions, right, I, sometimes I call them the, the cut-off oppressions, the abandonment oppressions, in which you have something that's really actually quite unnatural, which is to have a parent disown or um, not support a child. Um, they interrupt the life cycle, and ageism and age gets really important into this one. So I have my students think through the difference of being kicked out of the house when you're 19 and disowned at 19, than when you're 13, and how very, very difficult life can be when you've been kicked out on the street at 13. Trying to come back from that gets really, really difficult. Uh, we have a very large number of queer youth who are out on the street because they're a very, very vulnerable population. So these oppressions have a lot to do with age. So we want to start thinking about this formative stuff, right? So as people are being formed and shaped into who they're going to be, if they are told that this is nasty and disgusting and awful, it's really going to start to seep in. And then they may get thrown out onto the streets and the problem that we're having is that our queer kids are really doing horribly all the way through. When it's your own mother who says that she wishes that you'd never been born, that you are wrong and evil and sick, that kind of stuff can cut deeper in a way that is not uh, the same when it's somebody else saying it. Recovering from that is really, really hard. So I, I usually ask my students to think through what it feels like to have this going on in your life at 8 and 12 and 16 and 20 and how different each of those stages is going to be but how very tender and vulnerable we are when we are young and how this really shapes who we are. So one of the bigger problems that we have when it comes to queer phobia isn't the lack of marriage equality which is nice, it's nice and it's great that we have it. I'm not poo-pooing it but one of the bigger problems that we have is that our, our folks aren't making it into adulthood. They're dying young. Because one of the bigger risks that we have is the social exclusion and the suicide and the self-harm. Self so we want to start thinking about the fact that this isn't something we're going to solve with legislation in, in terms of marriage equality and, and job protection, which is nice. But we want to make sure that we're actually changing the entire structure of society so that we don't have kids who are at the mercy of abusive parents. So that every child gets a chance to grow up with safety and kindness and love. Another thing that's particularly difficult is that these dynamics, right, we have the extreme cases, right, the abuse, the kicking out, the on the streets, but in most of the cases it's a lot more ambivalent. So what happens if you have a really homophobic father that you really, really love, that says, um, okay, um, fine, you're gay, but don't ever talk about it. Don't ever bring a girlfriend home. Don't ever mention this. Or what if it's just a little bit more subtle? What if it's not even said aloud, don't ever do this, but just the never-ending silence around it? If you ever mention your girlfriend, I'll make sure never to talk about it. I will change the subject immediately so that you know that this is not something that you can talk to me about. What do you do in those scenarios? What happens when you're trying to maintain a relationship, but this person is mistreating you in some pretty horrible ways? I have my students think through the difference. For example, you can strike against the factory owner. That's relatively, I wouldn't say easy, but it's straightforward in that you know what you're doing. 
but can you go on strike against your parents? And what does that look like? And there's some very interesting cases of sibling solidarity and sibling support where uh, siblings will band together and say, fine, if you don't let her bring her girlfriend to Christmas, then I won't be coming either. And the other sibling saying, and I'm not coming either. And at this point, the siblings had banded together in support of the one queer sibling and said, we're going to have our own Christmas over here. If you wanted to join us, you could. But if you're not going to behave yourself, then you are not welcome. All of a sudden, the dynamic has changed, right? The siblings, the adult children have banded together and supported one, saying, you were not hurt them. We will not stand for this. That's a way that we can kind of change the power dynamics within a family and saying, power dynamics within a family are tricky and they often involve age, right? There's that ageism thing again, that supposedly respect and uh, authority have to come with age. And so the people who are older than you have to be respected and trusted and obeyed in ways that younger people don't have to. So we can shift the power balance a little bit, sometimes by banding together at the lower levels and saying, we're gonna get the kids together. So there's stories of uh, sisters giving their trans sister clothing. I'm saying, here, I'm gonna sneak you a dress. I'm gonna sneak you a skirt because mom and dad won't buy you one, but at least you get to have one in your closet. So that little bit of shared support can be really important. But understanding the power dynamics within a family gets really tricky because they're sometimes more social um, and more emotional than in the other kinds of oppressions. Um, this is stuff to think about. We also wanna think about the fact that being orphaned or being cut off can be really damaging, even as an adult. So if you think about all the support that you've gotten as an adult from your birth family, it could be everything from babysitting services to the loan of a car to sometimes an emergency loan to even just having a friendly ear for advice or just having somebody love you in the world. These are huge, great benefits that you get even as an adult. We tend to think about family as supportive through childhood into adulthood, but even as an adult, you're getting a ton, a ton of support. So when it comes to thinking about what the dynamics are like when somebody's considering coming out as queer to their family, in many cases, these folks were terrified of losing their entire support structure and losing all the people that they love. Sometimes people get really flippant about it and say, oh, these people are de deceptive, they're liars, why don't they just, uh, why aren't they proud of themselves and out about it without recognizing the incredible, incredible risk that comes with coming out and how that is not a possibility for many folks. The more privilege you have, the easier it is for you, right? If you are white, cisgender, able-bodied, um, with a nice fat bank account. Life is much easier. It's much less risky for you to come out as queer than for somebody who is uh, brown, disabled, and has no money. So we want to think about this privilege. I want to get my students really ready to get away from this notion that everybody has to come out and that coming out is truthful and honest and that not coming out is deceitful and hurtful. Um, these are the stereotypes that we float around um, in our society. One analogy that I like, which is difficult, is to think through the fact that for some folks, coming out will mean losing their entire family, and they know it. They know the risk involved. So for them, it is as if their entire family had died overnight in a car crash. All of a sudden, everybody died. And if somebody actually had that happen, where their entire family died physically in one night, we would have all kinds of community support for that. Like, there would be people coming out with casseroles. There would be scholarships. Everybody would come out and say, oh my God, this young person, they need help. How could this happen? This is horrible. We would have a lot of understanding and compassion and support for that. However, we don't have the same for coming out, even though for many folks, it can mean the exact same thing. It can mean the night that your entire family died at once. So I try to get my non-queer students to recognize that when they're asking about coming out stories, they could be asking about the night that everybody died and that they should treat it with a lot of respect and kindness and reverence in some case. Like, don't bring it up casually. It's not something you ask about over chips and say, oh, so how's your family taking it? What if this is the person who actually lost their entire family? What if this is somebody who had to migrate because of homophobia? 
do not take this lightly. This is somebody's life story and it, there's likely a lot of pain around it. Another thing that is difficult when the oppressions are coming from within a household is that you may be very isolated. So there may not be other people like you. So for example, if you're the only person in your, in your family who uses a wheelchair, you may not get a lot of training about wheelchair use from your family. You're pretty isolated. You may never have had a conversation with somebody else who uses a wheelchair, who can give you tips on how to get around and how to deal with people as they interact with you. Since you don't have this training and support, it can be really hard to figure out what is up. So for example, when it comes to queerness, you may be the only queer person you know, especially when you're a young person. There may not be anybody in your family who's out or anybody in your school who is out. You may not have anybody to talk about this with. This can be really lonely and not knowing whether this is a you thing or this is something that other people experience, being completely cut off, not just from your birth family, but also from your own community. Not having anybody around you can be incredibly lonesome and dangerous because you don't have the training that you need. This isolation is part of the problem that we have when I've said that some of the higher risks that we have have to do with social exclusion and, um, and suicide and self-harm. So if we imagine a young person's life who has had horrendous abuse, um, inflicted pain, um, emotional abuse, told that they are defective, kicked out of the house when they are young, trying to make it through, um, trying to find a way of staying safe in the world when they're out on the street at 15, um, dealing with the grief and the pain of losing their entire support family as they are now trying to come to terms with who they are and getting rejected by the outside world as well. They may eventually, through a lot of time and energy, be able to create a new support network. But remember, this can take years and decades of working relationships until you have somebody who feels as close to you as a sister might or as a parent might. This is stuff that takes a lot of time and energy and work to get created. Sometimes we call this chosen family. And after you've gone all this, after you've dealt with the grief, the grief of losing your birth family, after you've put in the time to create a chosen family, you want to think about the risk involved with a chosen family in that a chosen family has no legal protection. None at all. So, for example, I am an immigrant and I have citizenship in the U.S. I could support my brother, my biological brother, into coming into this country and support him with immigration processes. However, my best friend, who is my sister in the world, I could never do that with. Because technically, we are nobody to each other. We don't exist. There is no legal bond that can be recognized. She is nobody. So after you've gone through all the time and trouble to create this chosen family, they can't really inherit from you unless you create a will specifically stating that. You can't support them in the way that you could a blood sibling. These are all the structures that we've built up that make life much, much easier for cisgender and heterosexual folks than for queer folks. We want to start thinking about how to take apart those structures so that we can make that gap smaller and smaller all the time. Another thing to think about um, when it comes to queerness is the issue that this, in many cases, is a non-visible phenomenon. And so, this is an identity that, and I'm not going to say always, and we'll talk about the visible uh, cases in just a second. We're going to start with the non-visible cases, in which people do not necessarily read this on your body. So as you walk through the world, you are not perceived as gay, uh, or queer, or trans. There's some problems with this. Um, here's one thing to keep in mind is perception is really important. You may feel one way, but the way that people perceive you is going to direct how they interact with you. So we want to always focus on perception because it's different than identity. So right now we're just talking about how people perceive you and interact with you. So folks who have identities that are not very easily read on them, so for example, folks with psychiatric diagnoses, um, folks uh, who are atheist, uh, folks who are queer, um, folks who um, are passing immigrants like myself. So whenever you have an identity that is not perceived outright, you may have some dynamics that are pretty tricky. Like, for example, you need to invest a lot of time and energy into information management. 
who do I tell, what do I tell? Who needs to know, who doesn't need to know? How often, right? This is something that you either have to mention or not mention all the time. You're always trying to keep track of who knows what story. Um, the phenomenon of closeting, of having to create information and hide information, um, is really incredibly exhausting. And uh, one of my favorite analogies is it's like having to pass gas. So having to fart and having to hold it in. It is incredibly tense all of the time. If you let your guard down for a second, it can slip and just break apart in a minute. So that information management gets to be a huge part of your life. It's exhausting to the point where sometimes people say, like, I'd rather not. I'm just even going to forego all of this just so that I don't even have to manage this all of the time. You may even have to deal with closeting and compatibility when it comes to choosing a partner. You may be wonderful for each other. You may make each other laugh. You may uh, be completely, incredibly in love and be wonderfully happy with each other. For example, if you have a lot of incompatibility when it comes to closeting, if one of you absolutely needs to make sure that nobody knows about this relationship and the other one really, really does not want to take part in all of the information management that comes with closeting, that's going to create a big rift in your relationship that heterosexual folks don't even have to deal with. They don't have to deal with this fact at all. I remember when I've been in heterosexual semen relationships, so when I've been partnered with males, how much easier it was. <laughs> and when I am partnered with non-male folks, how much harder it is. It even gets to be a part of the relationship. We even get to say it's like you, me, and the homophobia. And I wish that I had it as easy as I did when I was just partnering with men. And it just had to do with you and me. Um, figuring out how to know who you can trust gets really important when you have a non-visible identity, right? So when you have to manage the decision of who do I tell, what do I tell, when do I tell, how do I tell, um, figuring out who you can trust becomes a big part of your life. So you, for example, for the little kids, uh, they may at all times be paying attention to who is around them. So when somebody makes a homophobic joke, they're paying attention to, is this about me? And they may shut down and say, okay, aunt, Aunt Jenny is not somebody safe that I can trust. She's on my off list. Um, sometimes people might have to do things like testing the waters or reading cues. Like, is this somebody safe that I could talk about my atheism with? Or is this somebody who is going to punish me for it? They might do the testing behavior in which you bring something up to see how somebody's going to react and say, oh, did you see in the news about the transgender ban? in the hopes of having you give something back and seeing how you're taking that and recognizing you as a safe or unsafe person to come out to. Another problem with non-visible identities, and this is a big one, is that if people can't read this identity on you, then they're going to have a harder time being in community with you. You don't know who your people are. So this is something that happens to me all the time. I may be queer, but I don't know who else is queer. This gaydar notion really is mostly stereotypes. I don't know who queer people are in the room until they tell me. And so without knowing who can back me up, I don't know if I'm alone, and I may feel really, really alone when I'm actually surrounded by queer people. Until we actually come out and say, hey, are you queer? I won't know who'll have my back in the room if something goes down. It's gonna be really hard to organize the community um, because I won't know who I can count on. So for example, the spaces where we can get together get to be really, really important. So a gay bar becomes a sacred space, right? You may have lost your birth family. You may not have a support network anymore. You may not know as you're walking down the sidewalk who else is queer. There may be one space in the world where you can go to know that the people around you are gay. Like, literally, it is safe to hit on this person. Not, they may not like me, but it is actually safe for me to make a move here because somebody will understand what I'm doing and not be grossed out by it. And or I may be able to find friends here. This is a space where I can go to connect. And that is incredibly powerful when you go through life feeling completely alone. 
And that's the other thing about non-visible identities, is that sometimes we may choose to mark ourselves so that others can recognize us. So for me, my rainbow ring is something that I'm really, really proud of and really happy with all of the time. My rainbow ring is something that's new to me and that I get to wear every single day now, now, in this privileged space that I have. Um, because it lets me know that people can see me and I'm hoping that it lets people know that they can trust me as well. So this wearing a visible marker on my body is really, really important and powerful for me. One more thing about non-visible identities is since you have right, a stigmatized identity that is not visible on your body, you may be able to benefit from passing privilege. So the way that people perceive you is really important. So for example, I was partnered with a male for a very long time, so I was perceived to be heterosexual. So I, in this particular case, got a lot of heterosexual privilege. For example, I was able to marry and uh, get citizenship in the process. That is a huge, huge benefit that I got from being partnered with a male, and that's a, a, a bi and pan issue. Um, but since I was perceived as heterosexual, I got a ton of perks for it along the way. Likewise, right? I am an immigrant, however, I'm often perceived to be local. People are genuinely surprised that I'm an immigrant because they don't read that on me. I get a ton of privilege just by that perception that people give me. Again, it's not a matter of whether I'm meanly trying to benefit from it and get something that I don't deserve. It has to do with how people perceive me and the boosts that they're going to give me just because of how they read me. So non-visible identities have a lot to do with passing privilege. Here's the thing. Sometimes these are visible identities. So identities that have a visible marker that people can read on you um, have their own dynamics in that they can be exhausting. You can never get away from this. For example, sexism. You can never get away from being perceived as a woman. Again, with some asterisks on there, it can get more complex than that. Um, when it comes to racism, if people perceive you to be brown, they will always be interacting with you as if you are brown. You can never get away from this identity and it gets really draining. So the interaction that you had, you'll never know, hey, was that just, are they having a bad day or was that transphobia that just happened right there? Are they reading me as trans and are they being mean to me about it? Is that what's happening or is it a whole, a whole different thing? When people can read this identity on you, there may be some dynamics that you do. Like, um, you may find yourself trying to compensate for the stereotypes. So, um, if one of the stereotypes that we have is that uh, queer folks are sexually promiscuous and sexually aggressive, we may be trying to compensate by making sure that people read us as not sexually aggressive at all. Like, I'm not, I'm not trying to hit on you at all. And I've had many experiences where I'm trying to do that and let people know, it's like, hey, I'm, I'm, I don't mean, I'm not trying to hit on you, I, I wanna make sure that you're not getting the wrong impression here. Or if the expectation is that we're very promiscuous, you may volunteer information and say, well, you know, I may be gay, but I'm monogamous and I don't ever cheat. So that you're actually trying to work against the stereotypes about your group. You may try to um, if this is a visible identity that people can see on you, you may try to acknowledge that difference to kind of put people at ease. So you may mention, like, if you um, are very visibly trans, you may mention your transness right away so that people can like have a little sigh of relief because that's been said now and so now I can say it too. So getting to acknowledge that identity um, or getting to work against the stereotype may be uh, dynamics that you bring up. So, for example, um, sizeism. So being large size is a very visible identity. So if you're a very large size person, um, you might say, uh, well, you know, um, I eat really well and I exercise all the time. So you may bring that information right into the conversation right away so that people have that and that they're not associating you with those people. I may be large, but I'm not like those people. These are all the dynamics that we force people into because of their oppressed identities. These are all the ways that internalization happens and the way that people try to survive within a system that is designed to hurt them. Um, we wanna talk about how 
the intersections of these identities, so the ways that these identities combine, make life very different. So we'll say, it is hard being queer. It is really hard being queer. It is harder being queer and brown. So we talked about, for example, how uh, racism is exhausting and how as you're moving through the world, it can be incredibly dangerous to live through, to live with racism because the world is actively hostile to you. However, for brown folks, when you come home, you can often, not always, but often have a little bit of a rest because you get to be among people who really get it, people who understand what racism is like, who can give you support and can give you some training around coping. They can give you some strategies. So home is a little space that you can feel just a little bit safe, just a little island of rest. That's when you're just brown. Now, when you're brown and queer, remember we just talked about all the ways that it's really, it can be incredibly hurtful to be in a household with people who hate people like you. So not only is the world hostile to you because you're brown, but then your house can be hostile to you because you are queer. So this is how we're thinking about intersection. And you want to remember that you are going to be in different identities at different points. You're either going to have more power and less knowledge and less power and more knowledge about a dynamic. You always want to keep this in mind so that you're questioning yourself all the time. When it comes to sizeism, is it my job here to stay still and listen? Or is it my job to educate and or fight? Where am I coming at with this? Remember that we want to talk about solidarity. So solidarity is when you care about somebody else's problem and you want to help dismantle and break the system that helps you and hurts them. So as we're working in coalitions, as we're working through different identities and we're all coming together to work at changing the world to be a better place, we want to recognize that coalition work gets really, really, really hard. You have to invest a lot of time into educating. You have to know that there's going to be a lot of mistakes made. You have to get together and agree on what strategy you're going to use or even what the priorities are going to be. So coalition work, so where people are working from different identities and working together towards a goal, is really, really exhausting. However, it's the only way that we actually can create social change. It's the only way that we can have enough numbers and enough strength and enough materials and resources to get together to push back to break the systems that are keeping us down. So coalition work, exhausting, but so very important. So I'm hoping that you've learned some skills for how to show up a little bit better for the folks who are um, hurting from the oppressions that you benefit from, and vice versa. I'm hoping that you have some better ideas of the oppressions that are hurting you and how you can help dismantle them a little bit. I've created a website that I'm pretty proud of called everydaysocialjustice.com. And what I'm doing with it is I'm putting all of my teaching materials on there for free. So I am putting up my online course, putting up all of the materials that I've created for my students, and I'm actually pretty happy with it. Um, it's still growing. Um, I do a kind of teaching called a flipped classroom methodology, which is kind of fascinating. Um, so the idea behind it is, is that you kind of take a regular classroom in which um, the lecturing would usually go on and I would talk at you for hours in the classroom and then you would go home and try to remember what I said and try to apply that into an essay or homework. Um, the idea is to kind of take it and go backwards. So what I do with my students is I send them home and the lecturing is done at home with videos or cartoons and memes. So the more passive part is done through video or through other mediums, and that way people can kind of do the passive receptive stuff where they're just kind of trying to get their head around these ideas by themselves. So they get to do it at their own pace. So if there's something they didn't understand, they can rewind it and play it again instead of kind of trying to raise their hand and ask the question in class <clears throat> where they may be really embarrassed or it's still not getting it after the third time it's explained. So letting them work at their own pace is something that I really like. Also, as a teacher, I like that they get to pre-digest the ideas. Sometimes some of the stuff I'm talking about can be pretty shocking and overwhelming for folks because it's the first time that they question the world that they're living in. And so I'm hoping to have the shock and awe part done at home and have them pre-digest and think about stuff a little bit before coming to class. And now the in-class time, which is the most valuable time that we have, which is the in-person time where we can interact, 
Uh, that time is saved for the really, really, really juicy work. The harder stuff where you're actually trying to apply the concepts. So you understand the concepts at home and in class you get to do the homework or the application work. And so I've created um, worksheets and activities and problems and scenarios for my students to solve. So I have them sit together in groups of threes and fours and they have a series of tasks to complete. And they get to help each other out when they're stuck and they say, well, I didn't really understand that. And I, it's a joy to me to have them explain it to each other and see how they can kind of get their own head around how to explain this concept that they thought they understood until they actually tried to put it into words. So the classroom time to me is a lot more valuable because we get to do much, much cooler stuff. So I'm really excited about the website because I've gotten to put up the lectures, the prep materials, the prep questions, the worksheets. And for my online students, I've been creating a series of kind of like wrap up videos in which I do a little bit tiny summary of what's been going on for the week. So those are available on my website as well. Um, and they are free and available to the world because it's kind of how I show up in the world and do social justice work is as a teacher. My hope, my hope, and my goal is that I can explain really hard stuff with as simple language as I can, uh, with the simplest materials that I can that people can actually relate to. And so I'm hoping that offering this up and that sharing this with the world can help people who are teaching uh, teach better. Um, and I'm hoping that I can learn from them as well. And I'm also hoping that for folks who are not taking a social justice class right now, that they can get on the site and actually learn for themselves and walk themselves through one of the lessons in, in the lesson plan or a few of the lessons or actually take the whole course online. So that's free and available on my site. And I am a happy teaching nerd. So if you wanna call me and talk shop or email me and uh, work on something together or ask me a question or share your materials, I would really love that because I love geeking out about this. So I'm really honored to have spent this time with you at the Empowered Trans Women Summit. Um, and it is a, an honor for me that you would have me speak even though I know that as a cisgender person, I make all kinds of mistakes all the time and I make ridiculous, horrible transphobic mistakes. And every time I try my very best to unscrew up as fast as I can, to apologize, to validate and to learn. So I'm, I'm grateful that you've made space for me here and I would like to offer any help and support or materials that I can. And I actually would love it love it. Oh, please. <laughs> if you would let me know where there's spinach in my teeth, because I know I made a ton of mistakes in this video, but I'm hoping that you're well and that you're enjoying the summit.